to go through some of the basics in marketing. So as you can see, you want to so you want to sell your fish. Here is my checklist. I don't have a, a long checklist for that, but we'll go through some issues that I think any fish producer needs to think about if uh, he or she is thinking of selling their fish. So here is going to be the outline for this presentation. I'm hoping that we could finish early and then have some discussion. So I want to go through some of the studies that are out there, uh, look at the food market landscape, and then we'll look at it from the demand perspective and also look at it from the supply pers perspective. And then I'll go through my checklist and then I'll make some comments on the marketing mix models. Some of you probably have heard some of these before. And then I'll conclude with a comment, a comment on group marketing. So here is an infographic that uh, appeared in the Agri American Agricultural Economics Association magazine, Choices. And this study particularly looked at the effects of COVID on the food supply, the supply chain, looked at labor issues and also look, looked at consumption and also look at consumer issues. At your bottom right hand is something about the consumers, which I want to highlight. So that study points out that with the COVID situations, households are really making financial adjustments based on their expectation of what everything is going to be in terms of the economy. But then they conclude that in the long run, con consumers are going to continue shopping online and, <coughs> excuse me, and behaviors, <coughs> behaviors are changed. And so there is demand for local food and food safety attributes. So what comes out of that and the article and many others that are being published, in fact, there are a lot of uh, publications out there in terms of COVID. What you can get out of it is that food shopping habits are changing. And <clears throat> there is a lot more home food preparation. And economists call it more home production. Cooking from the scratch. Excuse me. <clears throat> There's demand for convenience meal foods. There's e-shopping, and then there is demand for local foods. Many of you are aware of this because of the current situation. Sometime in May, there was an article published in the New York Times. And basically what they were saying is that people are cooking more seafood as never before. And it's because of the lockdown and all the issues with the restrictions, the movement and stay at home orders and all that. In addition to that, if you look at the annual survey of national restaurant associations, they have what they call hot spots uh, among chefs, meat and seafood consistently have ranked among the top five positions. So that tells us that seafood, consumers like seafood, it's a preferred product and there is market out there for it. Another comment I want to make is about food hubs. Uh, Michigan State did a study in 2017. And unfortunately, when we talk about food, uh, local foods, Food hubs is one of the main you know, components of local foods, but unfortunately seafood is not one of the major products handled by these food hubs. So in that study, uh, they found out that fish and seafood, they considered 12 categories of food. And out of the 12 categories, fish and seafood ranked 11, with only 17% of food hubs carrying fish and seafood. That tells you that there's room there. 
and probably we need to understand uh, some of the challenges that maybe is making food hubs not handle fish and seafood. And one of the striking things from that survey is that if you look at uh, 2015 to 2017, they did a study in 2015 and did it again in 2017. All the categories that were studied, they were all sourcing their food items within the region. And it increased, those who were sourcing the food items within the region increased from 2015 to 2017. The only exception in terms of food category was fish and seafood that was not being sourced within the region. So that tells us that there are opportunities for, for local fish farmers to sell their seafood in the local community. I also want to highlight uh, a study. Those of you in aquaculture have seen this study by Jonathan and uh, Jonathan from Virginia Tech and then Mark Smith from Ohio State University and other groups of what they looked at during the COVID era. Uh, this is the first quarter results. And they were looking at, you know, some of the questions they were asking were, what are the primary channels for these fish farmers? And you can see the ones that I'm highlighting in red, direct to retail, about 18% of respondents indicated that they sell through that, 11% uh, sell through restaurants, 3% grocery stores, 8% uh, and then other. So that tells you that there are some fish producers who are selling through directly through some of these channels. And then in the second quarter, they asked a similar question. And you can see that the numbers don't change a lot in terms of percentages. But the point I'm making from this is that there are some selling to consumers, to restaurants, to grocery stores, and others. Another thing they asked was, what percentage of your sales is going through these various channels? And this was the results from quarter two as well. About 44%, those who responded, about 44% of their sales is going direct to consumers, about 24% going to restaurants directly, 36% uh, of what they are producing going to grocery stores, other businesses and other. So that looking at these results, it tells us that some are doing it and the opportunities are there. And then if you look at those who are doing direct to consumers or direct end users, uh, these are the various ways that they are selling, home delivery, capsite pickup, uh, some open retail outlets, online sales. So again, it tells you that there are these opportunities some farmers are utilizing to get their fish to the end consumers. And then they look at specific species, the catfish, the salmon, and other uh, food fish. For catfish producers, about 33%, you know, a third each were adopting capsite pickup, a third were doing online sales, a, a third were doing direct sales. For salmon producers, it was about 50-50, uh, home delivery for them, and then also doing some online sales. And then if you group all others together, about 40% were doing online sales, and then you have the home delivery, capsite pickup, and others. So with all that, if you are a farmer and you are not doing it and you are interested in it, what are some of the things you need to consider? And that's the checklist I'm talking about. So the first one is that you have to do your homework. So if you're a fish producer, especially small and medium, medium-sized farm, and you are thinking of selling your fish directly, you have to do your homework. Some of the questions you need to be asking and trying to find answers to is, who are you going to sell to? You know, who do you sell to now? And who, are, who is the target group that you want, to, you want to sell to? Who are these customers? Can you identify them? You know, we saw in the previous slides that I showed you, some were doing directly to end consumers, some were doing restaurants, some were doing to grocery stores. 
but you need to identify where do you want to sell your uh, where do you want to sell your fish who are your customers you have to be able to identify these and then ask yourself is it going to be your long term strategy is this going to be your target market that is something you need to be asking yourself so doing your homework as you try to do answer this question you'll be collecting information to understand who your customers are and how you can create value to them. So by identifying your customers, you need to understand some of the things that they need. So what are the needs of these customers? Definitely, if you look at different customers, whether direct to consumers, grocery stores, restaurants, or other marketing channels, each one of them has a separate or a different need. And you should be able to identify the customers, what those needs are, and then why do they need you know, to buy fish anyway? Those are some of the things you, you, you need to understand because once you understand your customer, then you know that you will be supplying what they are actually looking for. When, where, and how often will they need the fish that you, you want to supply them. In what form? You know, do they want them processed? And even if it's processed, in what form? Uh, in whole dress fish or processed in the form of fillets? So again, understand your customer. What inform I mean, what are they looking for? And try to meet that information or the need that they are looking for and understand that. So there are certain things that you, might, you should understand when it comes to marketing. It's different from selling. When we talk about marketing, we are thinking long-term. Uh, long-term where you understand the customer and their needs, you adapt to the customers, and then you adjust to the customers. And all of us are consumers and customers as well. And you know that our needs keep changing. And so as a good marketer, uh, as a good fish farmer who wants to sell your fish, you need to be able to adapt and adjust to what your customers are looking, looking for. And so always keep in mind that your focus should be on the customer. That's the long-term thinking that you, you have to be uh, thinking about. Selling, on the other hand, is you are thinking short-term. I have some fish, how can I sell it and make money? Or, you know, I have this inventory and then, you know, how can I push it out? Uh, one of the things that as a fish farmer, you always have to understand is that for those who are new, before you even think about producing the fish, you need to think about how you are going to sell the fish. So don't have a sales mindset. So the sales mindset is where you first produce the fish and then you are figuring out how you are going to sell it. Your emphasis is on the product. And sometimes you can have some aggressive sales marketing strategy simply because you want to sell fish. And if you are selling, it's more of your interest as a seller than the customer that you are selling to. So you are more interested on you making some money, you know, because you might, having, you might be having some cash flow issues, or you are trying to survive the competition. There are some, there's competition out there. So you want to make sure that you are also part of the competition. So think about that. Don't have the sales mindset, but have a marketing mindset. And what is the marketing mindset? Again, the customer comes first. You identify what the needs are, what the changing needs are, and that's what you have to uh, you you have to focus on. You are planning long term about your business. Long term, you are not thinking of getting into the business uh, of producing fish, maybe for the short run, making thinking you make a ton of money and then getting out of that. It doesn't work that way when it comes to fish farming. If it's something that you really want to be in it, you need to think long, 
long term. And that is how to have the, that marketing mindset. The other mindset is the production mindset, uh, especially for those who are thinking about starting a fish farm or going into aquaculture. They tend to think about, okay, what can I produce? Uh, can I produce this cheap? I mean, will there be a demand for it? Those are the wrong questions you'll be asking yourself. The right questions will be, what is the customer looking for? And then when you know what the customer is looking for, then you think about what to produce to meet that. So that is something that uh, I encourage fish farmers to really think about. So summary, do your homework. And the homework is first think about marketing before you, you think of producing your fish. And think about marketing as a process. It's a long-term process, it's not short-term. And you have to explore opportunities of the customers. What are the needs of the customers? What are the problems or challenges that customers are facing? And you want to explore that opportunity to solve that problem or to meet that need. And because it's a process, you, want, you need to refine that and evaluate that as time goes on. And so it requires monitoring, continuous monitoring of your marketing strategies as you understand uh, the process of marketing. That's very important. My second point here is building relationships. If you talk to any marketer, they will tell you that relationship partnerships is very, very important especially for small producers, for medium-sized producers. If you want to sell directly, especially take advantage of the local food system and sell, in the com and sell your fish in the community, you need to develop partnerships. You need to form collaborations. You need to explore niche opp opportunities because these are the things that will help you establish your customer base. You can also use those relationships to leverage community net networks. So uh, later in this series, you will hear about social media promotion and other things that fish farmers can utilize. But relationships will be a good starting point where you can build that network and also leverage resources that are available in your community. So by building that network, you can build your customer base. And as you build your customer base, you can really target the customers that you are looking for. And through that, you can build some loyalty. And example, if you are thinking of processing, for example, there are some community infrastructure and resources that you, know, you can tap into. There is the local food systems out there. There are food corps, there are food caps, they are CSA, they are restaurants, they are kitchens. These are local or community resources that if you are a small scale fish producer and you are looking for some of these niche opportunities, they are available in your community and, and you can easily tap into it and make, you, make use of these available resources. One of the things if you read the marketing literature is that any producer, and it doesn't apply to only food fish. It applies to everyone who is producing a product and is looking at marketing and building up relationship. It's like having a farmer mentality. What we understand with farmers is that farmers are cultivators. They cultivate and they see their crops grow. In the same way, if you have that mentality when it comes to building relationships in marketing, relationship marketing. You are cultivating your customers. You cultivate that relationship and then you grow that relationship. And as you grow the relationship, nurture the customers that you are building. That way you understand their needs, you understand their problems, and then you can provide solutions and the value that you are looking for. And especially for this industry, aquaculture industry, it's agriculture. So as a fish farmer, you are a farmer 
And therefore, just as we cultivate and grow and nurture our fish to the market, to a market size that we want to sell, let's have that same mentality of cultivation so that we can yield better relationships and partnerships in our community if we want to sell directly. Building relationships is very important. Uh, direct marketing is a shorter supply chain. And examples we have you know, in our industry is those who sell to ethnic markets like you know, uh, Chinatown, most of them take live fish. So we have some fish producers in our industry who, don't, who do not process their fish, but they sell live to the Asian market. If you talk to any of them, they will tell you that building relationship with your customers is very important. You cannot produce your fish and drive to Chinatown and think that any of the grocery stores will just be open and taking your fish. You have to build that relationship. It's very, very important. So as you build that relationship, it helps you in the whole supply chain to get your fish to, to the market. The third point I want to make is you have to have a plan. So first, you understand the market. Do your homework, understand your customers, understand what their needs are, understand what their problems are, what are some of the things they are looking for, and you try to meet those needs and try to meet, provide solutions to what they are looking for. And then building and cultivating that relationship. So once you do that, you have to have a plan. So the plan, as I've said earlier, you have to shift your focus from the product to the customer. And marketing nowadays is, has moved from being transactional to relationship. And so that is very important. Marketing has shifted from being just transactional, especially if you want to do direct marketing. It's, it's not a transactional thing anymore. Part of this is transactional, but relationship is very, very important. So one of the things you need to check once you, you are thinking of a plan, is these tests that you have to look at. It's the plan, in, in, in your plan, you have to ask yourself and you have to prove that a market really does exist for your fish. And you can get answer to that based on the previous uh, two uh, points that we've made, that you really understand the market, you built up the relationship, and so you can be sure and prove that definitely a market exists for what you are trying to market here. And then also do a competitive test. Uh, you evaluate your position as a farmer and relative to your customers and also how you can distinguish yourself from others. Because, I mean, it's a competition out there. You are not, you are not the only person in town selling fish. There are, they are getting their fish from other places. And so how different are you? And then the value test. Uh, you have to prove that what you are doing, selling your fish, at the end of the day, you are going to cover your costs. You are going to make some profit out of it. Uh, cover your costs and make some additional profit. One of the things that I always advise people interested in getting into fish farming is that you are not going to make a ton of money in doing fish farming. And the margins are, not, are, are very tight. And so whatever you are doing, you have to ensure that at least you are covering your costs. That's very important. So in the plan, you are organizing yourself in a way to sell your fish profitably, or at least covering your costs and making some, uh, some margin on it. And then you are studying, you study the market and really you understand the opportunities that are available from your relationship that you've cultivated You've identified customer groups and what their needs are, and you are going to ensure that those needs are, are met. And then you are going to highlight some of the differences you have from the others, other products that are available to these customers. So 
one of the things that when you do a marketing plan is the marketing mix, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it next, uh, where you look at different uh, issues when, when, when you are doing marketing. So you will have your strategies in terms of the various factors you are considering in your mix, and then you are finding a profitable way to get your fish out there. And especially common these days is to have a story behind your product. Have some personal touch behind your product. That's very important. And that you know, fits into the marketing mix strategies that I'm going to talk about. So some of you, if you, you know, listen to tons of marketing webinars or lectures or things like that, you're familiar with the four Ps, the products, the place, the price, the promotion. This is classic marketing 101 that you learn in school and you hear everywhere. But if you really dig into the literature, people have come up with all kinds of variations. Even with the four Ps, some have added uh, one P to it for personnel, so it's now five Ps. Others have added three Ps and they have seven Ps. And then you have the four Cs. This school of thought, you know, is that, well, the four Ps focuses more on the product and not on the customer. It focuses more on production, on the producer, the Ps, not the customer. And so they come up with four Cs. The consumer, you need to focus on the consumer. You need to focus on the convenience, how convenient the customer can get access to what you are selling, and then the cost, and then communication. And then others came and, and you know, others were the opinion that, well, four Ps, four Cs are all okay, but four Es probably expresses more of what the whole marketing process should be. Uh, a customer should have an experience so not that a customer, a customer's need necessarily being met, but that a customer should have an experience either you know, eating your products or becoming familiar with your product or something like that. So they came up with the four E's, every place, exchange, and then they have evangelism. And then the recent school of thought is what they call the SAVE. And the save actually uh, came from another one, the, the savvy, where the I is information, not education. So the information, the save thought school of thought was that the I is more information. It's a one-way information flow. But when you talk about education, the education is more about information exchange, two-way flow. So you provide information to your customers and then you get a feedback from that. So let's talk a little bit about this. So whether it's four Ps, whether it's four Cs, whether it's four Es, or whether it's the same, you are all looking at a target market. And the target market is the customer, your consumers that you are looking for. So let's put all of them together and then try to understand what each one of them is saying. And my reading of the literature is that it's pretty much all together. So whether it's the first P of product or the first C of customer experience or solutions, they are all you know, about getting the customer what he's looking for. So what are the customers actually looking for? Are they looking for a product? Are they looking for an experience? Are they looking for a solution? So those are the things that the first uh, factor is trying to look at. What is special about, about what you are offering to these customers? How is it different from, from the competition? And so with, with that, if you are thinking about experience, you are thinking about product quality, you are thinking about specialty, you are thinking about attributes like taste and freshness. Okay. 
So I hope, yeah. So a little bit of something we need to think about. If you see this picture, what comes to mind? The concept here is not selling bottles of beer. But if you see the beer in ice displayed this way, the message that is being put across is that it's a test quenching satisfying experience. And that's what this picture portrays and not just bottles of beer. So in marketing, you always have to think about what the need and the experience the customer is going to get from buying your product. So in this case, it's refreshment and satisfaction. You get refreshment and satisfaction. And I'm sure all of you who are beer drinkers out there will, you know, will agree with that. And all the commercials that you see about beer on your TVs every time. So let's come to our industry, uh, the aquaculture industry. If you see a picture like this, just what, what comes to your mind? If this is how you are selling your fish, how would a customer consider this? I'm not asking for an answer, but think about it. If you see something like this as a picture displaying your product, what do you think portrays to your customers? That is something you need to think about. If you see a picture like that, again, what does your customer pick up from such a portrayal of the product that you are trying to offer them? And then here's another one. So these are the things that I think fish farmers to think should think about when they are going to sell their products. Once they have identified their customers and what the needs are, whether you are selling directly to end consumers or selling to grocery stores or selling to restaurants, whichever way you are selling, or even if you are going online, think about how the, the portrayal of your product, how your customers will take it. And then when you come to the second factor, which um, some of you are familiar with the price, the C's call it the cost, the four E's call it exchange, and then the SAVE uh, theorem calls it the value. So there are strategies for pricing your product. You have the cost pl plus pricing where you make a margin. The value-based pricing is more of what the consumer thinks than what the, is actually costing you. And then the competition is actually based on what is prevailing. One thing you need to understand is that prices affect purchases. Consumers or customers are always price conscious. Even if you are selling to local restaurants or grocery, local grocery stores, the price they will be buying from you is very important because they also want to make sure that they make some margin out of whatever they are buying from you. But again, keep, at, keep it at the back of your mind as a fish farmer that at least you need to cover your cost. When we talk about value, value, like I said, it's more of the perceived benefit. So for a given price, the value increases as perceived benefits increases. So as the customers perceive the benefits and the importance of what you are offering them, then the value goes up. So sell value, don't compete on price. That's very important. And so in the long run, as I said earlier, marketing is a process. It's not a one-time thing, it's a process. So think long-term and shift your focus from price to a better value to your customers. And then we have place, convenience, every place and access. This deals with how the customers will find your product. Uh, in, the, in the marketing literature, some have termed it the customer's purchase journey. How you get the customer to find your product. That's very important. And it all depends on the channel. And then the 
last factor there is communicating. Uh, communicating what you are selling to your customers, uh, others call it evangelism, education, whichever way you call it. The main idea is that there is some information you have, a, you have about your product, you have a story to tell, and you want to get it out there and then get a feedback from your customers. So that is also very important. So these are the marketing mix that you really need to factor into your marketing plan. So those are the, my main three points that you need to identify your customers, understand the market, understand their needs, build that relationship, uh, build up net, networks, leverage local resources, and then have a plan. Before I move on to some of my closing comments, one of the things I wanted to point out, and I came to find out this from USD, that, and this is something I think the aquaculture industry can really benefit from. So USDA has this program, Process Verified Program, the PVP. So it's a means to assure customers of a verified quality of product. And some of the things that you, know, you can do in this process is traceability, um, no antibiotics, uh, or if you are using antibiotics, responsible use of antibiotics, uh, you are raising your fish on vegetarian diet. You can talk about issues relating to sustainability. You are not using fish meal or things like that. You are not using hormones or steroids or things like that. So my understanding of this program is that you as a producer, as a farmer, you have to choose certain standards that you are following in your production process. So you are producing, fish, you have certain standards that you are following. And you have, you will work with USDA on various process points. And USDA will verify these process points. And with the verification, you can ascertain that and get this logo on the product you are, that you are selling. So once USDA, you work with USDA and they can audit this process, they can verify it. Another thing they talk about is they can duplicate it even on other farms. Then you can use this dialogo. And I think it's a very good uh, avenue that some of our farmers who are really thinking of some processing or even if it's not processing, but directly selling to restaurants, to local grocery stores, you can use, you can work with USDA and come up with this logo to help you verify the quality of the product or the processes that you use to tell the story behind your product. So these are some of the examples that uh, I saw where you see the USDA process verified logo on products. And if you go to their website down there, uh, you can get more information about this. The last comment I want to make is about group marketing, and we've seen this before. What I'm thinking is that there will be some farmers out there who will say that, well, with all what you've been saying, I'm not that good at really studying the market, doing market research, understanding marketing needs and all that. Or somebody will say, I'm not good at building or cultivating that relationship. All that I want to focus in is produce my fish. And then others will say that, well, for a plan, I'm not that, you know, I'm not the type that I can really put something on paper that way. One of the things you must be thinking about is that what about the possibility of linking up with others for group marketing? One example that comes to mind is Southern Illinois they sell their fish live to Asian markets all over, uh, Toronto in Canada, to Chicago, to New York. And they have a model that I think helps. They don't process their fish, they sell it live as a marketing, more or less like a cooperative. But it's very beneficial to them because I talked about relationship marketing earlier, building relationship with these ethnic, eth ethnic markets. But with them selling as a group, 
it affords them a larger investment pool and spreads their risk. It improves on their bargaining power and it helps them capture a lot better profit, I mean, better amount of what the customer is paying. So for some of the small and medium scale producers, I will encourage you if you are not the type that is savvy with market research or building relationships or having a plan, consider linking up with like-minded people like you who have fish, who are willing to market as a group. Group marketing will give you access to networks. Uh, Southern Illinois, for example, is a good example where they coordinate their uh, production and harvesting process for marketing. It's been a really good uh, model that has helped a lot of farmers in Southern Illinois. And so if you're a small farmer, if you're a small producer, and you think that going alone is not something for you, think about group marketing. So what is the take home message here? Do your research, do your homework, build up the relationship, have a market marketing plan and explore group marketing opportunities. And so that is something that, you know, I think I want to help farmers who are interested in direct marketing, farmers who are interested in you know, selling directly to local food systems, to restaurants, to grocery stores, to really think about because there are opportunities out there. And if you cannot do it alone, you can explore group marketing opportunities. So I want to end there. And if there are any questions, uh, we can talk about that. Thank you for your patience and for listening. Thank you, Kwamina. We do have one question right now. I don't, will you go back to the slide of the graph um, that showed the different percentages, sales percentages? Yeah. So Jessica asks, what do the red arrows mean on these slides? No, I was just highlighting where the direct sales is going to be. So if we are selling direct to customers, direct to restaurants, direct to grocery store, that's what the red arrow means. If we are selling to processors and, and distributors, these normally, the processor are going to buy your fish whole from the farm and then they are going to process them. But I'm thinking of where a producer is thinking of either doing some preliminary processing and selling directly to customers, to restaurants and grocery stores. That's what the arrow means. Thank you. So we wanted to make sure that there was enough time for people to ask direct questions. If you would like to, you can either e enter those questions into the chat or you could raise your hand and unmute yourself when you're called upon if you wanna ask instead of typing that into the chat. Kwamina, while we're waiting, there's been quite a few shifts in the market this year, and some farmers have found that the markets that they had that were well established no, were no longer ordering fish. Do you have um, advice for people that have farmers that have suddenly experienced a shift in market? So, like what? Um... I mean, everybody's experienced some disruptions with the COVID. And so I'm sure there are customers who normally buy their fish are also experiencing some challenges. So it's, I would say explore additional ones, or maybe you can verify from them, you know, what are some of the challenges, if it's something that has to do with product supply or things like that and see where you can meet meet those challenges. But if it has to do with the uh, 
operations and general structural things because of COVID, there's not much probably a farmer can do. So I think one needs to understand the customer and some of the challenges and where they think they can meet, they could do that. Others, I mean, other ways is also to expand the marketing channel, look for additional markets because the way the markets are right now, uh, focusing on one channel probably is not the advisable thing to do. You have to diversify your marketing channel. It looks like the market, you know, the market keeps shifting. I mean, things are changing all the time and we should be able to diversify our marketing channels and marketing opportunities that we explore as well. Okay, our next question is from Don Schreiner. He asks, how is group marketing different from a co-op or is it the same thing? They are not the same. Um, group marketing is where a group of them come together and decide that instead of doing it alone, let's say you have outlets like grocery stores or restaurants that are looking for some regular supply based on some quantities. One person may not have it. And so group marketing, you can pull those resources together and try to fulfill those or pull your resources together to sort of improve your bargaining power, things like that. There are different cooperative models out there, which probably I wouldn't want to go into it, but cooperative often has to do with some management issues, um, some bylaws and things like that, that it goes into actual administration of the cooperative. But for group marketing, you can have just a coordinator who coordinates things for you instead of administering the group as, uh, as a cooperative. But again, like I'm saying, there are different cooperative models out there that I, I don't want to get into it, but group marketing, that is a sure way that you can link up with others and see how you can pull your resources together to get your fish to the market. Okay, your next question is from Jessica, and she wants to know, for the new services that have exploded during COVID, do you have a marketing recommendation for working with meal kit services or the shopping services that offer limited information about products on their apps? For fish, I think a lot depends on the, what the customer is looking for. And my sense is that you have to process the fish if you want to work with these, uh, these apps and uh, organize meal delivery companies and apps because you cannot ship, you know, a live, not live, but, you know, whole fish. Not everybody is, you know, good at, processing fish in one shape or form. So processing will be a big thing. And that is something that farmers can explore, especially if you look at your community and there are resources in your community that you can utilize, like a kitchen or working with a restaurant or something to process fish. I think that would be a good way to work with them to take advantage of some of these meal kits and home delivery type of services. But you doing it alone, unless you have a means of processing your fish, I think that will be the challenge for many of, fish, many of the fish producers. Okay, your next question is in two parts. And this is from Bill. It appears that processing has not been considered as a very heavy with government regulations and cost. Question two is how do new farmers get share of existing live markets, restaurants, and stores, as well as wholesalers? So 
the first question has to do with processing, right? Yes, and the regulatory cost of it is expensive. Yes, it's expensive. And that is, I mean, if you want to put up your own processing facility, then you have to be prepared to go through all the training that is required and inspections and all that. But if you are working with a facility that has already gone through that process with inspection and all that, then probably what you have to do is just under, undergo the HACCP, the CFO HACCP training so that you can utilize these facilities to process your fish. That, that's what I'll say about it because it, you are right. It, it, it can be expensive trying to set up the processing on your own, uh, setting up you know, all the stainless steel and all the equipment and infrastructure that is required. The second question about live fish is that if you have the means of doing it, you can. But I'll come back to the relationship marketing I talked about. Uh, I've done quite a bit of this with, you know, the past years. The Asian markets, particularly where they buy the live fish, they need to be familiar with your products because these fish, they are swimming in the tank. So when their customers come, they see the fish swimming in their aquarium tanks and then they select which one they are looking for. And they want to ensure that when customers come, you know, they get a good, they can see good quality fish and pick from that. So if they are familiar with you and they know the quality of the fish you've been supplying, then they will be comfortable taking fish from you all the time. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you just walk in with your fish and trying to sell to them, that is going to be a hard sell. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it will be better to build that relationship first if you want to do it. Other than that, you can link up with, we have live haulers, people who have already established markets out there, who would, the live haulers, haulers who will come to your farm and pick up if you have enough quantities that they think uh, it's worth driving to your farm. They have established that relationship and then they can come to your farm and pick your fish and add it to whatever they are supplying to their customers. Emmy. Sorry, uh, that question came from Bill and he had added a little bit oh, extra on to that. Um, so the comment after that was, I have been producing tilapia for over 20 years and shipped many tons per week on a regular basis of weather or competition, but the COVID-19 has shut those live markets down. So knowing that, so a farmer who's been in business for 20 years, who's had a steady live market, and all of a sudden that market shut down, what advice would you give to him on how to break into a new market, whether it be a store, a restaurant, or a wholesaler? Yeah, Bill, sorry to hear that. It's, it's really a tough, a tough thing for a lot of fish farmers. And um, I don't know what we can, I mean, one of the things you can do is, it depends on, I don't know how much volume you are producing, but if you are producing a lot, then that's going to be one of the challenges, probably exploring some other local, when I say local, I mean ethnic markets within driving distance from where you are. I don't know where you were selling to, but because of all these restrictions, I know that movement is, is a challenge. Right now, since you've not tried the processed fish market before, it's not something that I think you can just jump with your two feet into it. You probably need to start something small and explore it to see how it goes. And I'm really sorry for, for the situation. Uh, we really want to see our fish farmers succeed and COVID has really disrupted a lot of things.
we have four more minutes. Are there any more questions? I mean, can you talk about this series and what we probably need to be expecting months ahead? I can. So this webinar is the first in our aquaculture marketing webinar series. Um, our thought was we would start with kind of general marketing 101, and then we're going to go into more specific topics. So the Kwamina had touched on how important it was to tell your story when you're selling your fish. In December, Lisa Tossi from Marilyn Sea Grant, who's in communications, she's going to be giving a talk on um, taking seafood social, sharing your story, and making connections through online platforms. And that's going to be on December 15th at 7 p.m. So she's going to be giving tips on how to use social media uh, to drive engagement and to um, be able to share your story. And then we're going to um, take a break for January. And in February, we're going to talk about consumer preference. And we'll be sharing information on future webinars as well as the recordings after each webinar ends. Okay, Kwamina, we have one more question. This is from Theo. Any ideas on how to get consumers to cook fish at home? UWM studies say 40% of fish markets was from restaurants and disappeared with COVID. Was that covered? Say it again, how to cook fish at home? How do we get consumers to cook more fish at home now that we've seen a shift from people eating out at restaurants to people eating more at home? I think we need, I mean, we need to do a good job with uh, cooking demonstrations, you know, videos on recipes and things like that. That will really help because one of the things that has prevented people from cooking seafood at home is, you know, there are many people who don't know how to prepare it. But I think if we really do a good job as an industry uh, with cooking the most videos and education, educating people on, on seafood preparation and the benefits of seafood preparation, seafood, I think it will go a long way to help consumers uh, prepare seafood at home. A lot of these, um, I'm, I'm sure it's a lot of people have been challenged in some way trying to prepare seafood at home, but the situation requires that they do it, and that's why they are doing it. But we'll, we'll, they will be better off with more information, you know, demonstrations and things like that. So, I mean, I agree, that's a really good question, and we, we need to do more to help consumers in that front. Well, that wraps our hour. Kwamina, thank you for giving our talk today. Welcome. And um, thank everybody for joining. Kwamina is available um, either by phone or through his um, email to answer questions at any time. So feel free to, if you want to pick his brain or engage more um, with him, reach out to him. He's available to um, discuss any marketing topics um, and lead you in the directions of resources, even outside of this time.